This week's video is going to be about a topic rather than just what I got up to in a week. And we're going to talk about my breeding policy here in this farm and really focus on the AI part of my year, which is from four months from December until the end of March. So I started AI yesterday with my first cow to serve. And this morning I have already been through the cows. We just use pink tail paint. We have no collars, no electronic system. It is just me checking the cows once a day. And after doing that this morning, I have eight cows to now check on the computer. My system is very simple. I write the number on a glove and then I put a number of exclamation points for how certain I am the cow is in heat. And if I'm not certain, like this one right here, 7712, I'll just put a question mark and I just check her on the computer and see what's the story. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'll flick the camera around so you can see my software, which is the next stage of choosing which cows to AI and which cows to not AI. If I was a professional YouTuber, I would just use screen capture, but I'm not that committed. Uh, 652. So this cow, 72 days in milk, and she calved on the 23rd of September, and her last heat was 354 days ago. So she got three exclamation points, so she's definitely in heat. So she will be added to the list of cows to AI. Okay, so I added all eight cows into the computer system. Three of them were not eligible for service because they were underneath our voluntary waiting period, which basically is 50 days that we will not serve a cow. So Let's now pick which bull each cow is going to get. So the first cow on our list is a cow 7454. Last year she got an R2D2 straw and she is out of a bull called Achiever. Now she has very low milk yield, 6,600 litres a year. So we're going to want to try to correct for that. So let's stick in a higher value for waiting for milk yield and it resorts our list. And we're also trying to correct some traits. So for example, this cow's foot angle is horrendous, so we're going to put a weighting on that. And we'll put a weighting on our other as well. And we'll zero these out. So it's recommending either Yamaska, which is a bull I have, um, or R2D2, or Knight. I also have Knight. So we can do a little preview over here of what the calf is likely to end up as. And this little graph here shows you what the previous breeding match ended up. So the hash line is where it thinks the linear will be from a simple average of the parent and sire. And then the colored bar is where the cow or the heifer actually scored. So you can see how fairly accurate the predicted linear is to the reality. Yes, there is some variation, of course, but it is a good way to predict linears. And that's what this little box does. So if I use Knight, this is the predicted linear I'll get. If I use Yamaska, that's the predicted linear I'm gonna get. So if I had to choose between them two, I'm gonna go with Yamaska. I think it's just a more balanced linear and yes, the mask has less milk yield, but if you look at foot angle, which is what we need to correct over here, your mask has a much steeper or shallower, I'm not sure, foot angle. So this is what we want to correct for. So that first cow is getting your mask. Okay, I will do the next five because it takes ages and I have to explain everything I'm doing. And then we'll go get some straws warmed up. And I will update my software with the new bills of get that done today or tomorrow. First job is to heat our water up. For that, I'm using a sous vide cooker of all things. This was like 60 pounds, maybe even less, and it heats the water up super quickly. So I bring the water up to like 36 degrees, and then we'll go get the cows once I have everything ready here. So the cows are locked in for as little time as possible. Okay, so my screen and my sous vide cooker broke like a year and a half ago, but I have I still remember the controls to set it to the temperature I want. So that will now hold the water at 35.5 um, for the entire duration of me, AI and cows. So it's a really, really cheap and good solution to heating water for AI. 
So I have four cows to move from one side of the cow house to the other because they're all still mixed up. If I seem very unprepared, that's because I am. This is the second day of AI, but we have to move four cows over and then get all five headlocked. And I forgot the list, so I'm gonna have to go back for it. Okay, I've got the list this time. So I'll sort these cows out, get them headlocked, and I will catch up with you when I'm about to AI the first cow, and I'll talk you through my journey of learning how to AI and what tips and tricks I have for you and how difficult I find the whole process. Okay, so that is two out of five AI'd, both went well. So I'm gonna run you through our straw prep, what I do here, and then we'll go and AI the next two cows and I'll bring you with me for them too. So I have two straws in the defrosting bucket, whatever you want to call it, and we have a Yamaska and a Sassafras. And I'll wait like 30 or 40 seconds before taking them out, and I need some roll and you're on top of it, so forgive me for the shaking camera. Now I was told to warn the paper towels but on TikTok, people told me that they've never heard that before. So if you're wondering, that's what I'm doing. We take one straw out. We dry it. Check what it is. So this is our Yamaska straw. And I have two colors on the end of my AI guns, a green and a yellow. And I try to stick to the same bulls and the same colour of straw throughout the year so that it's easier to remember. So Yamaska is going to be green for this year. We chop the tip off to open the straw up and then we put a sheath over the gun and that holds the straw in place as well as providing like sanitation. And that's our straw ready. I'll do the other one and then we'll go out some cows. So I'm gonna set you up with a view of the cow I'm AIing from the front. And you might not see me, but I'm gonna talk you through what I'm doing while I'm AIing a cow. And then afterwards, I'll take you through my journey of learning how to AI and all the pitfalls and how I ended up being able to actually do this. This is the one we're gonna AI. I'll set you down on the ground here and I'll talk you through the process. So we do all our AI in headlocks and it's to try to reduce stress on the cow. So we don't chase them over to a crush or anything like that. Um, so we also will do them in smaller batches. So we, I done two and then we let them out and then we've locked these two in and I'll do these two now. So, so I really struggled to learn how to AI cows. I have no idea why I struggled so much, but it, it genuinely took me three years to learn how to do this properly. And the process I have now is that I put my hand on just on top, just the finger to my fingertips on top of the cow's cervix. And then I put the AI gun through until I can feel the rough part, like sandpaper which is the start of the cervix. And at that point, I then grab the cervix and lift it. And it's kind of like holding on to a sausage. And then you have to try and get the AI gun through the first little gap in the cervix. So to describe what I can feel at the minute, I can feel the rough sandpapery texture coming through on the gun from the start of the cervix, but it, the gun still won't go through. So it's like it's pushing up against the dead end or catching on one of the rings around the cervix. And I've now started to make the way through the cervix. So if you move the cervix around, you'll find the gun will slip in really, really easily and just slide through. It doesn't take a lot of force at all. And that's me through the entire cervix. So this cow's cervix is maybe two centimeters in length. And now that I'm through, the gun slides really freely and I pull the gun back until I can just feel the tip starting to disappear into the cervix again. And then I push the straw out slowly. And that is 
the cow served. So I'm going to go do the next one. Now, I get that whenever I talk about it and just do it that quickly, it seems very easy. And unless you've actually tried to do it, you'll not truly understand just how difficult it can be to AI cows. And it's one of the things where it just takes a lot of practice. Okay, I'm about to start the second cow. You could spend 10 minutes thinking you're trying to get the gun through the cervix and then not realize that you're actually not even at the cervix. You're like trying to push it through a flap of skin that goes to nowhere or you're hitting the cervix side on or... And if a cow's not in heat, they're almost impossible to AI. So that's another big mistake people make at the start is you're trying to AI cows that aren't in heat and you're not understanding that. Well, that was for me anyway. Um, so this cow, it was slightly more difficult to get to the cervix. I had to keep bringing the gun way back out and going in again. Um, so I'm at the cervix now, I'm at the entrance again. It feels like rough sandpaper. And I'm just moving the gun around the face of the cervix, if that makes sense, until I find a way through. And I keep pulling back and going forward a few millimeters. And once I'm in the cervix, this is very simple to get through this cow's cervix. We're at the far side now, and there's always a temptation to go too far, but we're gonna pull it back until we can just feel the tip at the end of the cervix and put the straw out. If you go too far, you go down one of the two horns, and then you've limited your chance of success to a maximum of 50% of what it should have been, so you're better putting it in too early than too late. I'm talking like I'm an expert, I'm definitely not an expert. <laughs> right, now, Let them all out of the headlocks, and that's us done. Now, a very important bit to do now, which is save the AI records onto the computer system. And then after this, I'll tell you a story about how bad I was at AI and how long it took me to learn. Right, I'm gonna go look for this cow, which I've been unable to find, and I'm gonna tell you my journey on AI over the last eight years. So one of the big problems with our business when I came home to farm was our milk quality was really bad. Like we're talking bottom few percent of the herd of the national average. And it was one of the things that I really wanted to address and try to improve. And one of the ways I decided I would do that was through AI. But instead of doing the obvious logical thing of paying someone to come and AI my cows, which would have made oceans more sense and got results way quicker and been the smarter, cheaper thing to do, me being me, I think I can do everything and I decided I would learn to AI my cows myself. Now that would have been fine if I actually was able to do it and I had the ability to do it. But as I said, I just really struggled with it. So I went and done a three day course with one of my friends. And after the three days of trying to AI cows and trying to learn how to do it, I would say that I knew less then than when I started. And that is in no way a criticism of the course or their teacher, the friend I was with, he learned how to do it, no problem. The problem was the student and not the teacher. So I'd done my course and by the end of the three days, I still couldn't AI cow. To be honest, I think it made it worse, but Undeterred, I went ahead and bought 40 straws anyway and just decided I would continue my training at home and try to learn myself. So I've bought my 40 straws, I have to buy a flask, I have to buy AI guns, I have to buy a way to heat the water. I have a substantial investment in this at this point and I still don't know how to do it. The cows are not enjoying me recording a video in the cow house. They're all trying to run away from me. But as in everything in life, if you don't try, you're guaranteed to fail. So. I give it a go, I use my 40 straws. I really, really struggled. I really don't like me recording. I really, really struggled in the first few years and I don't really remember much about the very first year I AI'd other than when it came to scanning the cows, I expected the worst. I thought I had basically thrown away 40 straws and got no cows in calf. And I was pleasantly surprised to learn that out of AIing 40, 39 cows, I checked these numbers before I recorded this video, 
Out of 39 straws, I got nine cows and calves. So the very first year I bought two bulls. I bought one bull called Element and another bull called Primo. Both were Irish bulls, so they were on the EVI system. And in hindsight, that was also a mistake. They gave way too little milk for our system. Great cows, fertile cows, strong cows, survived here for a really long time, but they just didn't give milk. So I get there is an argument that maybe they were more profitable, but when you're milking a cow giving 5,000 liters, it kind of sucks. And the very first AI cow, AI calf born, was out of a bull called Element. And that cow went on to be a very famous cow on this farm. Because that cow was on our old flat rate feed system, where she was being fed for essentially 8,000 liters and she was giving 4,500 liters, she got really fat. Like she was a huge fat lump of a cow. And this is absolutely no reflection on my wife at all, right? And I need to make this very clear because some people aren't gonna get this. This is just kind of like my humor, our family's humor, okay? But because it was a special cow, because it was the first calf out of an AI cow or an AI bred calf on this farm that I had done, it was a special animal, okay? And my wife's name is Jessica, so we called this cow Jesse, okay? But you needed a more descriptive term for the cow. Jesse's quite boring. So we called the cow Fat Jesse, okay? <laughs> and that always gets a laugh. My wife tells everyone that. It is in no way a reflection of her. She goes to the gym, she's not fat at all, okay? Just to clarify. But that cow Fat Jesse was actually here from when she was born in 2014 until last year when she finally was culled. I think she'd done like six lactations. Throughout all of that, she gave next to no milk, but she was a good cow. Anyway, back to my story. So filled with my newfound confidence after achieving a staggering 22% conception rate in my first year, I decided to buy 150 straws for year two. And I also decided that I would do all of the breeding over winter and that the bull would be kept out until I was finished. I can kind of tell that you can see where this is going, but the second year did not go a lot better than the first year. I used 150 straws and I got 33 cows and calves. So I think that works out at like a 25% concession rate. So it's not catastrophic, but whenever you consider the extra cost of having them cows not in calf for longer and giving less milk and all the other problems come from not a perfect breeding system. It, at that point, I maybe should have give up and just paid someone to do it from then on. But that is not me, I do not give up. So I persevered and we head into year three. Year three, I get 45 cows and calves, so that's pretty good. But I use an astonishing 200 straws. <laughs> at this point, I am just trying to beat the system by throwing straws in everything I can possibly see. <laughs> and there was really two big issues I was facing and I was still facing in year three. And that was a fundamental lack of understanding of the process of AI and cows and how to do it. And just still struggling with every single cow. But I think by year three, my bigger problem was actually with my heat detection. I was assuming anything was a heat when in reality it wasn't. And in hindsight, now looking back, I understand that one of the big problems I faced in them first few years was actually nothing to do with my ability to AI or breed cows or detect heats. It was that the cows were suffering because of poor silage. And I was cutting the meal back on the cows too much, which meant that they weren't showing good heats. And there was much more wrapped up in my struggle to AI than just the process of AIing. But of course, whenever you're just home three or four years into your farming career, you have no other point of context and you can miss things like that very, very easily. Even now, if I have a year with pretty bad heats where the cows aren't showing clear signs, like I don't see cows jumping, don't you knock my camera over. I will still be able to tell if a cow is likely ready to be served or not. So we'll come on to heat detection at the end of this little section, but I'll just finish my AI journey first. Um, last year, I AI'd 155 cows, or 155 straws, and I got 57 calves from that. So it works out at like a 37% conception rate. The year previous, I got a 42% conception rate. So that should just give you an idea of where I've came to now versus where I started. 
And I still will AI things that are on the edge of, well, it might be in heat, I might as well just stick a straw in the cow. I do buy some cheap straws just for that purpose, so I can throw them away. So that does maybe artificially pull down my conception rate slightly. But overall, I'm very happy with my abilities now. I will still pay someone to come and AI my heifers if I'm doing a synchronized program, for example. I have AI'd plenty of heifers before myself, but they're just a struggle. And sometimes, which is a life lesson, which took me a long time to learn, you're better spending a little to save yourself money in the long term. But overall, I would highly recommend everyone learns to AI. And that might seem like a contradiction considering how much I struggled with learning how to do this, how much it probably cost me over the first few years in fertility and straws and all of the problems associated with that. But at the end of the day, it's a skill set I now have. It's something I can now do. And even though I personally find it really difficult, I got there in the end. And it's often too easy to take the easy option early on and to just pay someone to do it. But if you take that approach to everything in life, you'll never develop any new skills. You'll never get anywhere. So if anyone asked me for advice on whether they should AI their own cows, it would still be absolutely just take it carefully. Take your time. There's no rush. If you need to take four or five years and get someone to AI half of them and you do the other half so you can protect your business, that's a good idea. But it's a good skill to have, it's a very useful skill to have. If I see a cow that is running right now, I can have her locked and AI'd within five or 10 minutes. So the system now as it currently stands is that I will AI from December until the cows go to grass, which is usually middle of March. And then we have a two week break, maybe three week break. And that allows us to have a break of calving over Christmas, which is what we're in now. And then the bull will go out into the field and he'll take over the rest of the breeding. And then September, the bull is closed in. And that gives us, in theory, two months off over summer with no calvings. So we calve in two main blocks. We have a winter block and a spring block. And we're basically calving for nine months of the year. But there's two really big peaks, one in October, November, and the other in February, March. Let me just tell you a little bit in 60 seconds about our tailpain system. So every cow eligible for breeding is tail painted and I will top up these tail paints every day if needed. It can be hard to tell if a cow has been rubbed or not. So this heifer is a really good example. The tail paint is kind of like fluffed up. You'd nearly think that she was being jumped on. You have mark here again, which looks like she's been jumped on and you have dirty sides as well, which is another sign that she might have been jumped on. But because the tail paint this morning was fairly intact, I concluded not to AI this heifer. Which might have been a mistake now I'm really looking at her again, but it's too late to go back on that decision. This cow was running and I recorded her as a heat date, but she's not high enough days in milk to be AI'd. And just to give you an example of what I look for when detecting a heat, really dirty sides, cows jumping on her. Her tail paint is like flattened and like more matte and it's very obvious that it's been rubbed. And then the other side as well, you can see how dirty this area here is. They're all very clear signs that this cow has been in heat. When I detect them in heat, I will put a little mark on them just so it's easier for me later on to find them. Right. That's her locked, nice and simple. Let's go get a beef straw for her. All right, let's get her beef straw. So one of the biggest changes um, to my breeding policy in this year, the last two years really, has been to move away from genomic bulls. And I was a huge fan of genomics. I was a huge believer using six or seven bulls a year at least, trying to pick the best of the best. I loved playing the game of trying to choose which genomic bulls were likely to do well and do bad. And my opinion on genomics has absolutely been informed by my own mistakes and bad bulls which I've picked. But in my defense, 
there is literally no way to know. There is no way to know. Certainly, I can't tell if a bull is going to do well or do badly within genomics. And it's that element of risk which is having a negative effect on my business, which is why I've moved away from genomics. So I can't afford to have a batch of 10 heifers collapse and be terrible. That's no good for me. And likewise, if I get lucky, which I have for certain bulls I've used, and they turn out to be amazing heifers, it's no good to me either if I only have five or six of them. I want to have 30 heifers all from them good bulls. And the reality is I have that option. I can use proven bulls, be guaranteed an outcome. And if, for example, this year I bought more sassafras and I have sassafras milking this winter, so I know what them heifers are like. I know what they look like. I know what their udders are like. I know what their milk yields are like and their components. Why would I take another risk on potentially getting something better when I have a known? I know what I'm going to get. And I get that genomics is good for the overall industry. And this is like the contradiction. Is genomics a benefit for the dairy industry in the UK? Absolutely. It allows a much wider range of animals to get proofs and be sampled and be tested and the best of the best being identified from that wide range of animals. But for me as an individual farmer, it makes much more sense for me just to be selfish and just pick the best of the best which has been identified by everyone else and that is essentially what I'm doing from now on trying to use proven bulls trying to use the ones which have came out on top from everyone else doing genomics and I get it if I went on that it wouldn't be great but I've tested enough bad bulls <laughs> and when you actually look at the data and you look at the numbers um, which the breeding companies do not want to show you. They don't want you looking back at a bull's proof run over the last five years. If they did want you to do that, they'd show you it on their website. But when you look at that, a great example, one of the best, is a bull called Argonaut. Number one PLI bull in genomics. I bought a stock bull out of Argonaut. Absolute rubbish now. Like, totally collapsed. Batman. I have tons of heifers out of Batman. Milk yield, absolutely collapsed. When I bought him, this is from memory, so don't quote me. When I bought him, I think he was like five or 600 litres of milk. Today, he's just above zero. Anyway, I could waffle on all day. I'll not keep you any longer. Hopefully that gives you an idea of my breeding policy, of what I spend a lot of my winter doing, which is AI and cows, of why I switched back to proven bulls and away from genomics. And for anyone who's thinking about AI and cows, gives you some perspective on the fact that it is going to be difficult. It is not easy. But the only way to learn is through trying and doing and perseverance. Do you need to do a course on it? Probably not, but you do need someone to explain the basics. And I don't think I've done a good job of that in this video. I could have done a much better job. So I'll maybe do that video on TikTok or something at some point. Anyway, thank you for watching. I uh, very much appreciate it again. If you like this video, drop me a like. If you have any questions or suggestions for videos, drop them down in the comments below. And if you want, please subscribe. I'd very much appreciate it.